What's an example of a two spin system? I mean, is it two spins interacting? Is it two spins next to each other? Uh, yeah, it can be two spins. It's just two spins, really. Two spins, um, right. right. I mean, and um, they can or can or, I don't know. They don't necessarily have to be coupled, but it's really only a useful description when they're coupled because otherwise it's kind of boring. Um, because uh, if they're not coupled together, then your description with uh, then it would be enough to just describe one spin one half basically, and they would behave identically. Mm -hmm. But um, if they are coupled, then it sort of becomes more interesting because there's other sorts of evolution that we will talk about in a moment, mm -hmm. and then you want to go. So okay, sorry for uh, not investing the time and making this look prettier. <laughs> um, so. I guess the first thing that we have to consider is that our homotonion, if we have some coupling, and this is exactly what you're uh, we're pointing out, um, is now a little bit different. Before, if there's only one spin, one half, um, well, the homotonion, all it was, was just like some frequency times, say, IZ, right? And now uh, the homotonion becomes a little bit different. So what this says is omega 1 times i z omega 2 times s d plus 2 pi j, where p is pi, <laughs> you realize what happened here. <laughs> and um, i z s d. And so, um, right. And of course, the semitonian now, if we plug it into the Schrodinger equation, or if, or if we, we take this uh, form of the time, um, dependent uh, density matrix, uh, things become a little bit more complicated to evaluate, but still there are very useful commutation relationships that will allow us to easily evaluate the, um, the time evolution without having to uh, use a computer to calculate it in some cases. So, and the important um, commutation relationships, basically I try to summarize here, um, things like these all commute, so um, I see it as they commute, always when they're along the same. Um, access, basically, commute. And then these are kind of the important points to remember. So if you have terms like IC, SC, and if you want to evaluate the commutation relationship with Ix, then basically the, the way to remember this commutation relationship is to basically say, okay, well, Ix basically, in, in some vague sense, only has an effect on Iz, and then you just basically need to use the basic commutation relationship that you know of Ix, Iy, and Iz, and use that, put it in here, and leave the SC unchanged. Does that make sense, what's going on here? Right. And same is true, for instance, in this case, you have IZ, SC, and SX. Okay. So then you examine, oh, okay, well, I guess I only have to consider, uh, concern myself with this SD part here. So then IZ keeps unchanged, stays unchanged, and it's the usual commutation relationship between SC, SX, and SY. And so one thing you should also specify here is that those commutators that you're showing are cyclic commutators. Right. Exactly. So if you take two i z z z i x and i y s z, you call them a b c, and you have a cyclic commutation. Yeah, this is something I didn't specify. <coughs> this are. is very important because it's going to simplify a lot of the calculation of the FID. Exactly. <coughs> and then I guess there's a bunch of others that one can imagine to be zero. I mean, here, for instance, this, this one here is sort of, at least it kind of makes intuitive sense that this would be zero because it's all the admin along one um, axis. Um, right, and then of course things identity always commutes with anything. Right. And then I guess 
another case that Yeah, I don't know. Actually, what these ones in the bottom, I did not spend too much thinking about it. But I guess. Yeah, I uh, I would like to verify those. Like the 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 and the pen, the second line before the end is right. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, no, I wait. From the book. Okay. Um, so they should be right. <laughs> So I Z S I Z S Z commutes with I X S X commutes with I Y S Y. That's for sure. But yeah, and if you say that the book says that the other ones do right. also commute, it's true. But it would be interesting to make a calculation. Is it, is it true for spins one half? I remember this guy. Yeah, it's true for spin one half. I I've encountered that already. It's not true for spin one. Uh, for spin bigger than yeah. Or for spin three half. For spin no for spin bigger than one half, it's spin not true. Right. I, I've tried. I, I, I've tried it with spin one. I did the calculation. Yeah, the I did that too. I, 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 but I didn't, I didn't find a general. That, and, but, but I mean, so like in a totally unrelated manner, this is the reason why we see cross peaks in zero fields, two dimensional, yeah. or that kind of stuff. I mean, we. This is out of the subject here. Right. Okay, and then I guess just to make sure that we understood this computation relationship, there's exercises. So, and I guess. It would be kind of helpful to just go through them, and I guess it would just go one after the other. Maybe one would just step off. All right. Yeah. So just to write down uh, the effect of an anti x pulse on, say, i z plus s. Right. So I know the first two will do. Right. Because an anti x pulse has a form e to the minus i pi i x plus s x. So those two commutes, you can should I write them on? And use the result. Okay. So I mean I can write it down. Alright. Yeah. Yeah. So you can break everything. If it's got if it's if the propagator is e to the i pi i x plus s x, that's because these two can be e to the i pi i x e to the i pi s x. So then for the addition one, they're set, they're completely separable. So the first one. So this part will commute with uh, i z, and then that will cancel out. So we have just e to the i pi i x i z plus e to the minus i pi i x s x s z e to the i pi s x. So for the first two, that's how this is going to go. This one's going to be, I think, i y. This is s y. And then the second one, the i x is will commute, and the s x um, and the s y will be a minus s z, right? Right. Uh, but I don't, I don't know this last one. I don't see that operator in this cyclic relationship you defined. So I don't think it commutes with i x. Right? It does commute with i x. Does commute or with s so. x. It does not come with a sex, indeed. Mm. Right. So this is a tricky one. Because <laughs> I, I mean, I see, I know what the commutator would be, but I don't know if that. So if, right. if if you want, I can give you a kind of image of this kind of thing, because saying that all, so you know, these commutators that Thomas showed in this pre yeah. previous slide that I said that were cyclic commutators. This is extremely important. So if you want, I can give you this kind of image. Work on the board. Yeah, I, get, I mean, I get the impression that it's one of the secret commutators. I just yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. See where it fits. I mean, you wanna? So because I, I was proposing for a, a kind of like pictorial right. thing. Right. That's great. Just let, just give me one second okay. to return to this, just to make sure that uh, Bertram follows what's going on here. Um, so I don't know if you see that. Um, basically, what all, all that happens that you have to remember is that the IZ and the SD just gets converted by an anti x pulse into s y. And i y and s y. And then here in this case, we have i x and s y. Right? An x pulse doesn't affect the i x part, but only the s y part. Okay. okay, so I get the last one. I can say it. It's, it, it, just, it doesn't matter. Since the i x one commutes with the whole operator, then that part is removed from right, so it's only the S Y part. And yeah, that so it's just gonna be minus two I X S Z. Right. That's it. Right.